And I'm going to share my screen. There you are. Okay, so let's first talk about PhysioX number one, activity one. And your responsibilities for this entire PhysioX are as follows. You need to know the molecular weight cutoffs that you used for the dialysis tubing. And you need to know what solutes you used. Solutions, I should say. You also need to know that the idea is if we have dialysis tubing, molecular weight cutoff means that there are holes in that tubing. A molecular weight cutoff means that if anything is smaller than the molecular weight cutoff, it can get through the holes. Anything that is bigger, if it's a large solute, it won't be able to get through the holes. This is exactly like our dialysis experiment that we did together on Monday. It is a continuation of it. The solutions you played with, we played with sodium chloride, we played with urea, we played with glucose, and we played with albumin. The Monday, Wednesday class, they were a little bit worried that they had to quote memorize molecular weights and they weren't really quite thinking through things i said to them it's your responsibility to know the four molecular weights cutoffs that you use to use 20 50 100 and 200 and i told them it was up to them to know which solutions could pass through which dialysis tubings that were used. So let's just go through some of our data and perhaps you'll start to notice a trend. They really were so pre-consumed with, I have to memorize, I have to memorize. And I kept saying to them, if you remember what you did and what you played with, then there is no reason to memorize. You should know what you're doing in each of these activities, what materials you used, and you should remember what your outcomes were. So for example, we used a molecular weight cutoff dialysis tube of 20. So I'm gonna write the molecular weight cutoff up at the top. We put in sodium chloride. And we were asking the question, can it diffuse through the pores out of the tubing into the beaker? Sodium chloride has a molecular weight of 58.45. It's larger than 20. So did sodium chloride diffuse? It did not. Why could it not diffuse? It could not fit through the holes. So sodium chloride in that experiment, no diffusion. Then we used a molecular weight cutoff of 50. Again, we put in sodium chloride. 
Sodium chloride has a molecular weight of 58.45. Our molecular weight cutoff was 50. Did sodium chloride diffuse? Who actually did the experiment? Did sodium chloride diffuse out of this bag? No. No. Yes, it did. It absolutely did. Look at your data. You don't have a zero for zero diffusion. You have numbers. Sodium chloride was able to diffuse through these pores that have a molecular weight cutoff of 50. Why? If I just told you that sodium chloride has a molecular weight of 58.45, which is clearly bigger than 50, why am I saying to you all, who did this experiment? Because if you look at your data, sodium chloride did diffuse. And that is correct. Why was it able to diffuse through holes that had a molecular weight cutoff of 50? Because of the disassociation factor? So sodium chloride dissociates. It dissociates into sodium cation and chloride anion. And sodium has an atomic weight of 23 and chloride of 35 and some change. So those two ions are clearly smaller than 50. They're bigger than 20, but smaller than 50. So yes, sodium chloride did diffuse. Did sodium chloride diffuse when you used a molecular weight cutoff of 100? Of course it did. Once it can diffuse for one, it's going to be able to diffuse for them all, for all of the remaining ones. Even though we didn't do a molecular weight cutoff of 200, I'm sure you can realize that sodium chloride, once it's able to get through a pore of 50, it'll be able to get through a pore of 100 and 200. Now let's move on to urea. Now, we did the same thing with urea. We had, we used a molecular weight cutoff of 20. And we put urea in there. Did it diffuse when you use the molecular weight cutoff of 20? No. It did not. So that tells you it did not diffuse. It tells you that urea is clearly bigger than 20. Now we did not do a molecular weight cutoff of 50. We weren't asked to do that for some silly, stupid reason. But if you had been asked to do that, you would have seen that urea would not have moved with a molecular weight cutoff of 50. But you were asked to figure out if urea diffused when you used a molecular weight cutoff of 100. And when you used a molecular weight cutoff of 100, urea did, in fact, diffuse. What do these two experiments tell you? It tells you that urea must have a molecular weight higher than 50, but less than 100. You see, this is where the Monday, Wednesday class said, well, do I need to memorize urea's molecular weight? I said, why would you need to memorize it? You know it's bigger than 50, but less than 100. But hey, if you want to memorize it, go ahead. It has a molecular weight near 60, which is more than 50 and less than 100. Once it diffuses for a molecular weight cutoff of 100, of course, 
it would diffuse if we used a molecular weight cutoff of 200, even though we weren't asked to do that. <clears throat> what about, let's jump to glucose. We were asked to use a molecular weight cutoff of 200. And we did see glucose diffuse out of that bag. Glucose has a molecular weight of 180 grams per mole. The Monday, Wednesday class again said, do we have to memorize that? And I said, honestly, the important thing to know is that it was smaller than 200 and it left, it diffused out through the pores. And then I also said to them, the molecular weight glucose has been given to you so many times. It's in your lab manual as well. At this point, you should be sick of reading it. So it is 180 grams per mole. Your job again is to know what solutes you played with solutions, I should say, and when they were able to move through the dialysis tubing. With glucose, I'm sorry, with albumin, we put albumin in a dialysis bag that had a molecular weight cutoff of 200. Albumin was not able to diffuse. Albumin is a very large plasma protein. It has a molecular weight of hundreds of, well not hundreds, but tens of thousands for, uh, in kilodaltons. It's huge. It is much, much larger than these 200 molecular weight cutoff pores in this dialysis tubing. Are there any questions about this activity? Okay, well then let's move on to activity two. Activity two, we were looking at facilitated diffusion. By the way, these experiments go with lecture number one for this unit, membrane transport. I hope certainly by now you have watched most of the videos for lecture unit two. Membrane transport was the very first one in the list. Facilitated diffusion is a lot like simple diffusion in that the solute goes from high concentration to low concentration. Those brackets represent concentration. Facilitated diffusion does not require cellular energy. It does not require ATP. There is a big difference between facilitated diffusion and simple diffusion, and that is that there is a physical interaction between the carrier, that's the protein moving the substance, and the solute, the substance. You can think of your suitcase as a carrier. You pack your suitcase. There is clearly a physical interaction between the clothes you pack in that bag and the bag itself. How many clothes you can bring with you depends on how many bags you're bringing with you. If you only have one bag, you're going to be limited as to how many clothing items you can bring with you. The same is going to hold true for facilitated diffusion. The rate limiting factor
is the number of carriers. That is the rate limiting factor, the number of carriers. This is a concept that I talked about in that very first lecture called transport maximum. If you want the amount of transport to increase, you need more carriers. If you want more clothing items to go with you on your vacation, you need more bags. They can only carry so much. You want more clothes, you need more bags. Facilitated diffusion is not the only kind of membrane transport that has this physical interaction between the solute and the protein that acts as the carrier or the transporter. Other types of membrane transport that has this physical interaction include primary and secondary active transport. Any, any kind of membrane transport where there is a physical interaction between the protein doing the moving and the solute it is moving, there will be transport maximum. The number of carriers is the rate limiting factor. The number of suitcases you have will limit how many clothes you can bring with you. So let's go through activity two <clears throat> and explore this idea of rate limiting factor. Notice in chart number two that you were looking at a rate of movement. And the rate of movement was in millimoles per second. Millimoles per second. <clears throat> if we have more carriers, then we moved more. We moved more millimoles of solute per second. If you have more bags, more suitcases, you can move more clothes with you per trip. We were playing with glucose. And we were playing with two millimolar, eight millimolar, 10 millimolar, and we were playing with two millimolar mixed with two millimolar sodium chloride. We also had to build carriers. We built into our membrane 500 carriers. Think of suitcases, 500 suitcases versus 700 suitcases versus 100 suitcases. Think suitcases equaling number of carriers. Now two millimolar is less than eight millimolar which is less than 10 millimolar. And I want you to think of the glucose concentrations as the amount of clothing you want to bring with you. Now let's say you want to bring two items of clothes and um, your bag is the, is the equivalent of a one gallon Ziploc bag. 
you're going to be cramming those two pieces of clothing items into that Ziploc baggie. It would be more room. There would be more room if you had a bigger bag to put those two items of clothing in. But still, you're, you're still bringing just two items of clothing. That's not very much. That's not very hard to pack for. So with two millimolar, with 500 carriers, we were able to move 0 0.0008 millimoles per second. But when we had 700 carriers, we were able to move more glucose per second. 0 0.001 is larger than 0 0.0008. More carriers meant we could move more solute more rapidly, more millimoles per second. Well, now we increased the workload. We increased the workload to eight millimolar. And it took us with 500 carriers, 0 0.0023. We had more glucose to move, we had adequate carriers, and because we had adequate carriers, we moved more. We had more clothing to move, and we had the room for it. So we moved more millimoles per second. With 700 carriers, we were, even, we were able to move even more, 0.003 millimoles per second. So we had a higher workload, we had enough carriers to do that workload, and we were able to move a lot more per second. But then we went up to 10 millimole. And we did not use 500 or 700 carriers. Instead, we went down to 100. Now we don't have a lot of suitcases. We don't have a lot of carriers. We've cut it into a fraction of what we were playing with, 100 instead of 500, 100 instead of 700, and we're trying to move a lot more glucose. We're trying to pack more clothing items in fewer bags. This is a problem. What happened was the timer ran out you were not able to allow the diffusion of glucose to keep happening until equilibrium was reached. You see, that is also a characteristic of facilitated diffusion that is similar to simple diffusion. The movement will continue from high to low until equilibrium is reached. Remember, we are playing with an experimental setting. We are not playing with uh, a real uh, living cell. This is dialysis tubing that we're playing with and transporters that we're building into it. So when we went to 10 millimolar glucose using only 100 carriers, the timer in the PhysioX ran out on us. We weren't able to reach equilibrium. We did not finish moving this 10 millimolar glucose from one side to the other side until we reached equilibrium. The system timed out on us. If we were given more time, then these carriers would have eventually reached equilibrium, meaning moving five millimolar of glucose to the other side. So we would have five millimolar on both sides of this membrane. In our last experiment, we went back to 700 carriers. And we went back to two millimolar glucose, but this time, we added sodium chloride. And the question that the PhysioX was wanting us to think about was, 
if something else is in the mixture besides glucose, will these glucose carriers have a harder time moving the glucose? Will the sodium chloride, if you will, get in the way? And it turns out absolutely not. The carriers could care less if there is other stuff in the solution. The carriers are specific. So that this part of your experiment was really important. It told us about specificity. Carriers are specific. Transporters are specific for a solute or solutes that they bind with, interact with, and transport. They will not interact with anything else. Sodium chloride does not interact with a glucose carrier. Are there any questions about this activity? Unmute yourself if you do. Okay, you're awfully quiet. The Monday, Wednesday class had quite a few questions. And so maybe what I will do, uh, because I recorded their class time, maybe I will, if you want me to, I will give you the link to their recording in case you want to listen to some of the questions that they asked and some of the discussion we had. Um, I can think of a couple of discussions, conversations we had where we got a little off topic and had some fun that were related to questions that people had, but um, you could fast forward through those stories if you are not interested in them. But I will post their link if you want me to. If there aren't any questions, I'm going to move on to activity number three. Activity number three was looking at osmotic pressure. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Don't you think sneezing is like having an orgasm out of your nose? Doesn't it feel so good? <laughs> no, no one else shares that view. I love that. <laughs> you too. I think I think you kind of do share my view because here's why. Have you ever felt a sneeze coming on and then it didn't happen? Yes. Isn't that just as bad, don't you think, as feeling an orgasm orgasm coming on and then it doesn't happen? Think about that. I think it's just as bad. You're going to be thinking about that next time you sneeze now, aren't you? Okay, osmotic pressure. Sneezing, an orgasm through your nose. <clears throat> okay, osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure means you have unequal particle count in a volume, a specific volume, across a membrane. And the particle cannot move. If the particle cannot move, then what will? Water. Water. Yep. And which way will water go? Particles suck. 
it will go to the area of higher particle count. Another way of saying that in the video that we saw on Monday, water will go from high water potential to a lower water potential. Please take a moment to look at chart three. Take a moment to look at your data. Look at what we played with for activity three. Many of the things that we were experimenting with, we have already experimented with in activity one. Sodium chloride comes back. Glucose comes back. Albumin also comes back with glucose. Our molecular weight cutoff bags come back. You see, I shouldn't have to review as much with activity three because we've already covered in activity one which of these solutions will move through which molecular weight cutoff bag, right? We've already covered that. But we have a slightly different setup. <clears throat> and I'm going to draw it this way. Our setup is we have two beakers side by side. And there is dialysis tubing in between them. In our first experiment, we had a molecular weight cutoff of 20. My middle line here represents the dialysis tubing. On, in one beaker, we had nothing but pure water. And the other side, we had sodium chloride. Oops. Sodium chloride, I'll just draw it like this. From activity one, we should remember if sodium chloride is able to move or not. We had at the top of our beakers, we had a piston. We had a lid with a, a flat cap on top of it. And the idea was, if water was going to move from one side to the other, then the volume would change. If the volume rises on one side, you were applying a pressure to the piston to stop the movement of water. We started out with five millimolar sodium chloride. Can sodium chloride move through the molecular weight cutoff of 20? No. No. So if we have unequal particle count, which we do, and the particle cannot move, what will? Water. Which way did water move? To the left. So it moved from the water side to the sodium chloride side. And what would happen to the volume on the left side beaker? the volume would want to go up, wouldn't it? But you were there with your hand pressing down on that piston, <clears throat> opposing. You were pushing down, opposing the movement, the water pressure moving into that chamber. How hard did you have to press to stop the water from moving? Did anybody do it? 170. 170. 
170 millimeters of mercury worth of pressure, you had to push down to stop that water from moving. Okay, good. Then you repeated the experiment. You did the same thing, but on the second time, you used 10 millimolar sodium chloride. Now, how hard did you have to press? Three, four, 340. So the concentration doubled from five to 10, and the amount of pressure you had to push down also doubled. Do you know what that's called? That's called a direct relationship. The concentration doubled, the amount of pressure you applied also doubled. Then the third time we repeated this system, we again used 10 millimolar sodium chloride, but instead we used a molecular weight cutoff of 50, not 20. What happened? Did we have to apply any pressure? No, we didn't. We didn't, why not? Why didn't we have to apply a pressure to oppose water movement? Because sodium can move through 50 Correct. MWCO? Correct. No pressure. Why? Sodium chloride was permeable. Water will only move in a net fashion, net movement called osmosis, if there is unequal particle count across a biological membrane and the particles can't move. If they can, then they will, they will diffuse. We saw that in activity one. <clears throat> So then we said, okay, let's move on to something else. Let's look at glucose. Bye, sweetie. We again have water on one side. We used a molecular weight cutoff of 100 and we put eight millimolar glucose on the other side. Now that was weird. In the previous experiments, we worked with five millimolar and 10 millimolar. We went from five to 10 to double to see what would happen to osmotic pressure. And now PhysioX has us, one, using a totally different solute, glucose, and it has us using eight millimolar. What a random concentration. How strange. Well, no matter. Let's just apply what we know. What do we know? Will glucose move? No. No. So what will? Water. Which way? Towards the glucose. Towards the glucose. And again, we have our piston. And you know that you're gonna have to apply a pressure to oppose the movement of water. <clears throat> How much pressure did you have to apply? 136. 136 millimeters of mercury worth of pressure. Hmm, okay. Well, so far the trend is what we expect. If there is an equal particle count across the cell membrane, and if the particles cannot move, that means they're impermeable, then they won't move, and what will? Water. 
Okay, let's go back to this eight millimolar. What a random, what a random number. I want you to tell me exactly how much pressure you would have to apply. Excuse me. If we had used 10 millimolar. I want you to tell me. There are two ways you could figure this out. One, you can mathematically calculate it. How? Oh, I've already tested you on this on your chemistry and metric exam, how quickly we forget. Or two, you can simply look at your data and the number is right in front of you. Any takers? Anybody want to take a bite at the math approach? I think it's 170. Is that correct? I'm sorry. I think it's 170. Is that correct? That is the correct answer, but I'm interested, Hassan, in how you got there. Uh, that wasn't something like proportional. I just, uh, we had this experiment and the, and the math problem probably. Yeah. And uh, that's 8 over 10 equals 136 over x. So Hassan is using the direct relationship proportionality. x1 over y1 equals x2 over y2. You are correct, sir. So he said 8 over 136 is to 10 over question mark. And he solved for the unknown. And he is correct, it would be 170. But there was another way you could have answered this. And you didn't need math, but you did need to remember the following. Water doesn't care what the particle is. Water only cares if there is unequal particle count across a cell membrane, and it also cares if the particle cannot move. The other approach you could have used was to go back to your data for the sodium chloride. Do you remember when we played with five millimolar sodium chloride, you had to apply a pressure of 170. Do you remember? Five millimolar sodium chloride is what milliosmolar? Remember sodium chloride dissociates. So if I played with five millimolar, how many milliosmoles was I playing with in that experiment? Two. What is the dissociation factor, my sweets, for sodium chloride? Two. Two. Five times two is 10. We're playing with five millimolar sodium chloride, you were playing with 10 milliosmoles. And that is the pressure you had to apply, 170. In my challenge question, I asked you what is the pressure you would have to apply for 10 millimolar glucose? What is the dissociation factor for glucose? One. It's one. So when you were playing with 10 millimolar glucose, you were still playing with 10 milliosmoles, right? Milliosmolar. Water doesn't care what the particle is. It cares what the particle count is, especially if the particle cannot move. For 10 milliosmolar, concentration, you had to apply 170 millimeters of mercury. If you applied 10 milliosmolar worth of particles of glucose, 
you would still have to apply 170 millimeters of mercury of pressure. Water does not care what the particle is. It cares how many particles there are. And if they can't move, then water will. So then we repeated it again, um, the, the glucose and the glucose experiment. And with the next experiment with glucose, I believe we, in the next one, we put glucose so this is now experiment number one, two, three, four, five. Experiment number five, we put eight millimolar glucose in the other side as well. Now we have matching concentration, don't we? Was there any movement of water? Did you have to apply pressure at all? No. No. So no pressure. That's why you had a pressure of zero. The glucose still couldn't move, my friends, but the concentration was matched on either side of the membrane. And because the concentration is matched, that's all that water cares about at this point. Everything's matched. The amount of water, the amount of solutes are equal on either side. Then we repeated the experiment. And this time we went back to glucose being on one side. Water on the other. And we used a molecular weight cutoff of 200. Did we have to apply a pressure? No. Why? Because it was permeable. It was permeable. No pressure because glucose could move. Then we moved on. We moved on and we repeated this setup, we had a molecular weight cutoff of 200. We had glucose on one side, which I will draw here as purple dots. And we had albumin on the other. Now from exercise one, we know that glucose can move through this molecular weight cutoff membrane, but albumin cannot. Because glucose can move, it will. So the glucose is going to move to the albumin side. And glucose will diffuse until it reaches equilibrium. The albumin shown here as green dots will not be able to move. And now you can see on the right side where the albumin and glucose is, again, because glucose diffused, we have a lot more particles than the left side. So which way will water move? Towards, Towards albumin. Towards albumin. And you had to apply a pressure because the water went towards that albumin side. You had to apply a pressure to stop that movement and you applied a pressure of 153 millimeters of mercury. Okay, I told you that we test heavily on these experiments. This one in particular is heavily tested on. 
movement of water across biological membranes is important to us. One of your earliest lectures in unit one dealt with body fluid compartments for crying out loud. It's important, clinically important. So I am going to show you how I'm going to test you on this. And I'm going to give you guidelines on how to answer the questions. First of all, as I show you what I'm going to test you on, I'm going to be using pictures like I've been using tonight. But on your test, it will be all words. Remember, you're allowed to use scratch paper. As you read the words describing the setup for the experiment, feel free to draw it like I've been drawing with you all tonight. The test might read like the following. You have two beakers side by side, separated by a dialysis tubing with a molecular weight cutoff of 20. All right, so then draw it. Just like I have been tonight. Two beakers side by side with a molecular weight tubing in the middle with a molecular weight cutoff of 20. Dialysis tubing in the middle. Okay, so far so good. You have five millimolar sodium chloride on one side. All right, so write that down. And you have, you have water on the other side. All right, this is exactly what we did. I'm going to ask you which side has the highest osmotic pressure. Which side is it? The left. Water. The highest osmotic pressure is the side that has the most particles. Remember, particles suck. They pull water to them. And that means as the water moves towards that side, you have to apply pressure. So where, which side would you have to apply your pressure to stop the water movement? The left. On the left. So the highest osmotic pressure in this example would be on the left. All right, now answer this one. You have two beakers side by side, separated by a dialysis tubing with a molecular weight cutoff of 50. You have five millimolar sodium chloride on one side and five millimolar glucose on the other. Which side has the highest osmotic pressure? Now, before you answer, Here's how you get to the right answer. Number one, always ask yourself, do any of these solutes move? Do any of these solutes move? Is it none? Is it, well, only one, Kara? Or is it both? Is it, well, only one, Kara. Only one, that is correct. Which one can move? Sodium chloride. NaCl. Okay. So if only one moves, then the highest pressure is on the side that doesn't move. Okay. 
And we saw that in this experiment when we had glucose and albumin side by side. Glucose could move and it did. It diffused with half of the glucose going into the albumin side and the other half staying on the glucose side. It reached equilibrium. And that meant the albumin side now had a mixture of albumin and glucose. So if you start with your question, do any of these solutes move? And your answer is only one, then you are going to have to apply pressure on the side that has the solute that doesn't move. Because some of the sodium chloride in this example is going to move over to the glucose side. Good. Now, what about if we repeat this? Repeat this experiment, sodium chloride on one side, glucose on the other, but now we have a molecular weight cutoff of 200. Ask yourself the question again, do any of these solutes move? None, one, both? both? If both moves, then are you going to have unequal osmotic pressure? No. 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 If the particles can move, they will, and water doesn't care. So if both move, end of story. There is no pressure difference. You're not pressing on the piston. No difference, no pressure. Where did you see this? You saw this in the one, two, three, four, five, fifth experiment in chart three, where you had glucose on both sides. If the particles can move, they will and they will keep moving until there's equilibrium. This happens very rapidly. And there will not be net movement of water from one side to the other. No pressure. All right, let's try another one. You have a molecular weight cutoff of 20. You have five millimolar sodium chloride, five millimolar glucose. What's the first question you ask? Do any of these move? Do any of these move? No. Is it none? One? Both. And I heard someone say, none. If that is your answer, then you say to yourself, go to question number two. And question number two is, do any of these Dissociate. And what's the answer? Do any dissociate? Yes. Yes. So if yes, if yes, then the highest pressure is on the side with the solute that dissociates.
What is the dissociation factor for glucose? One. one. For glucose, it is one. So five millimolar stays as five milliosmolar. What's the dissociation factor for sodium chloride? Two. Mm -hmm. So five millimolar is 10 milliosmolar. We now have a 10 to five concentration difference. Which way will water move? Left. Towards the area with more particles. Particles suck. So towards the sodium chloride side. And that's the side you would have to press on the piston to stop the water from moving. You'd be applying a pressure. What are you going to mark on your test for this one? Is it you would mark that the sodium chloride has the higher pressure. Mm -hmm. Are you following your flow chart? Well, they can both move. No pressure. If they both can move, it's end of the game. There's mm -hmm. no pressure. Doesn't matter if there's unequal starting concentration. If they both can move, they will. Mm -hmm. They will diffuse. There won't be a net movement of water. What are you going to put for this one? Um, on albumin. Only one loops. Go through your chart. Do any of them move? No, they Neither one can move. Okay, then. If neither one can move, you go to question two. Do they dissociate? What's the dissociation factor for glucose? One. What's the dissociation factor for albumin? It doesn't. I don't know. Albumin is protein. You should know because this was on the list of dissociation factors that we asked you to know in your lab manual. 
the only things that dissociate are molecules that have an ionic bond. Glucose is covalently bonded. Albumin is a protein. Is it an ionic bond or covalent? It is covalent, so it doesn't dissociate. <clears throat> um, just so we're clear, specifically, in your lab manual, on the first 20 pages, 19 pages of your lab unit one, we asked you to know molecules that dissociate and we gave you their dissociation factors. And when we were learning about dissociation and we were talking about glucose and a lot of these <coughs> equations, it says on page 14, depending on how you printed it, solutes that are covalently bonded do not dissociate in water. Glucose is an example. Albumin is a protein. Proteins are not ionically bound. The amino acids in a protein are not held together with ionic bonds. They are covalent. The peptide bond is a covalent bond. Therefore, albumin does not dissociate. So there is no pressure. Even though we have very different solutes, the number of particles for each side is the same. And that's all that water cares about in these experiments. Are the particle counts the same across the membrane? If they are, great. Then there's no reason for water to move. Are there any questions about activity three? So for this one, um, is it because it's a protein? Because for the other one where it was five millimolar of NaCl and five millimolar of glucose, um, it did have pressure. So I'm kind of confused why this one wouldn't because it's the same amount. Sodium chloride is ionically bound mm -hmm. and sodium chloride will dissociate. Yeah. So Heidi, in the one that you're comparing to, mm -hmm. this one versus what other one are you comparing to? Um, the one where we had a 20, um, what do you call it? The one where it says five millimolar NaCl and five millimolar of glucose. But it was a molecular weight cutoff of 20. Yes. Okay, so then neither one could move. See our flow chart? Yeah. Then we had to move on to question number two. Do any of them dissociate? Mm -hmm. Sodium chloride does. It has a dissociation factor of two. So we multiply oh, yeah. five by two. So mm -hmm. this is the particle count. Mm -hmm. So for the other one, glucose, since the dissociation factor is one, it's not. So if it's one, then we still mm -hmm. have five particles. Oh, yeah. Okay. And same with albumin. If the dissociation factor is one, we still have five mm -hmm. particles. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Tara, really yeah. quick. Um, so we use that to find the mini osmolal, seeing how they don't have any pressure. But how come we didn't do that with sodium chloride? Which example, please, Omar? Well, let's go with the, the one right there that says 10, the one you have on the screen right now. This one up here? Yes, the one with the 200. How come we don't implement this, you know, the mini osmolal? factor into sodium chloride, but, but on the because bottom one. What is our first question? 
if there's pressure. No, well, that's what we're trying to solve. But when we're solving it, what is the first question we ask ourselves? Do they move? And if the answer is, yeah. Yes. Hold on. I don't know what ha happened to my mouse. If the answer is both move, we, we stop asking more questions. If both can move, they will. Then they will diffuse. Water will not have to move. Water will be happy because there will eventually be equal particles on either side. Okay. <clears throat> so here we have a molecular weight cutoff of 200. Both can move. So if they can move, they will diffuse. If the I, if this, if the solutes can diffuse, then water will not have a net movement. We saw this in activity three, experiment number three, when we had sodium chloride with a 50 molecular weight cutoff. In the third experiment, we had sodium chloride on one side and water on the other. We can use our questions, our flow chart the same. One, do any of these move? Does any, do any of the solutes move? Does sodium chloride move through a molecular weight cutoff of 50? Well, if it does, then it will, and it will reach equilibrium then there is no need for the water to shift from one side to the next. Sodium chloride will eventually spread out and then it will become equal on both sides. In that third experiment, we didn't have to apply a pressure at all. Okay, I guess it's just the mini osmolal part that you did for glucose and albu albumin that threw me off. They you, both only, you only need to do that if your first question is to the, if you're, the answer to the first question, do these move? You only need to worry about the milli osmolal if neither one moves. Okay, hey, thank you. Okay, here we go. Um, Kara, I have yeah. a question. Okay. Um, so for example, if we had um, a molecular weight cutoff at like 20, and then we had five millimeters of sodium chloride on one side, and then maybe like 15 millimeters of glucose on the other, um, since neither of them move and sodium chloride dissociates, but would it still, like, would more pressure be on the side of the glucose because there's more glucose, even though it dissociates on the NaCl side? Prove it to me, Aubrey. Answer the question. Okay, so we want to solve the pressure, right? Is there pressure? Your flow chart is and always will be. One, ask yourself, do any of these move? You said what? No. None. If the answer is none, then you go to question two, which is dissociation. What is your answer? Do any of these dissociate? Yes. All right, well then now, Omar, now we have to calculate that. So what do you do? You have five millimolar and you have to calculate 
what the milliosmolar will be with the dissociation factor. Sodium chloride has a dissociation factor of two. So now that tells you you have 10 milliosmolar. Glucose has a dissociation factor of one. So what will its milliosmolar be in this, in this example? It stays as 15, doesn't it? Water will move to an area of higher particle count. So Brie, where is the higher particle count? Glucose. Glucose. So the water will move to the glucose side and that is the side oops, you would have to apply pressure to to stop the water from moving. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That was a good question. The flow chart works. Solve for the question Will there be a pressure, an osmotic pressure on one in one chamber? If you start with the question, do any of these move? If both do, then they will. There is no osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure only occurs when there is unequal particles across a biological membrane and the particles can't move. When a particle can't move, that's when water will. And water will always move to the area of higher particle count. Your flow chart will not fail you. Anybody else have questions? That was a very good question, Bree. Thank you. Okay, well, we have one more activity to talk about, but we are at a point where I think I've made your heads explode and you need a break. So please go take a 10 minute break and I will see you at 7.30. Then we will finish this activity and begin to start our discussion on the neurophysio X. And around eight o'clock, Antoinette, one of the tutors at the LRC is going to be joining us tonight to explain the free tutoring that you can have at the LRC. She will tell you how to sign up for it not only that, she will tell you how to log on for those Zoom sessions. And I, I put all of this information under our tutoring section, but I find that students are not, they, so I just find it better when a tutor shows up and then you all see what a kind face they have and how willing they are to help you and then you feel more comfortable going to them. So Antoinette is going to join us and tell you about her tutoring schedule and the other two tutors, uh, Natasha and Nathan. Uh, and again, these are free tutors and they've been with me for years. And uh, many of you are on a tight budget. Maybe you can't afford Caitlin. These tutors would be free. Um, and these tutors still also provide private tutoring. Um, they have their own fees, but they still are uh, tutoring for free at the LRC for a few hours a week. So at eight o'clock, we have a guest coming to join us. I'll see you in about nine minutes and we will finish talking about some of this physio -X. All right, thank you. You're welcome.
Okay, let's move on to the last activity of Physio X, exercise one. So this is activity five. And in activity five, we were looking at primary active transport. Specifically, we were looking at the sodium potassium ATPase, primary active transport. Primary active transport still requires some sort of interaction between the protein and the solute, the protein that's moving the solute or solutes in this case. And that means we're gonna have a transport maximum. That means the number of carriers or number of pumps in this activity will be the rate limiting factor. Primary active transport also needs ATP. Now in this activity, what frustrated me the most is that we did five different experiments. And PhysioX in the workbook gave us no room whatsoever to write down our data. I found that to be very frustrating. I actually tried to write down my data in the tiny little picture that had a chart in the at the end of the um, of this section. So we had five different experiments. And before we start, we need to realize if this is a cell, I muted myself. If this is a cell, the sodium potassium ATPase moves three sodium out of the cell for every two potassium that are moved in. And ATP is used. ATP is a high energy molecule when ATP is hydrolyzed, we split off one of the phosphate groups. And when we do that, we get a lot of energy. And that energy can do work for us. In this case, for the sodium potassium ATPase. Now this sodium potassium ATPase, if it could talk to you, it would say, hey, are you noticing that I have a three to two ratio? I move three sodium for every two potassium, a three to two ratio. And when we look at our experiment that we did, we had a beaker, two beakers, set up side by side. We didn't have a molecular weight cutoff in between the two. Instead, we had a membrane where we built into it these pumps. We put a certain number of pumps. We started out with 500. And in some experiments, we went as high as 800. Again, I'll remind you from the earlier activity number two. This is an interaction between the protein, which acts as the transporter, and the solute. Because there is a physical interaction, we're going to see a transport maximum. The number of transporters is the rate limiting factor. The number of suitcases you have is the rate limiting factor 
for how many clothes you can take with you on your vacation. So we started out with our membrane with 500 pumps and we supplied ATP to our system. We started out with one millimolar. On one side, we had nine millimolar sodium chloride and we had six millimolar potassium chloride. Notice that nine to six is still a three to two ratio. The sodium potassium ATPase must have this three to two ratio. And again, we were looking at how many of these solutes were moved. That was our, our, um, our rate. Now our rate was supposed to be in millimoles per second but I actually think that PhysioX made a bit of a mistake when they were posting their rates. I believe their mistake is that they actually put it in time, the time it took to move the sodium chloride and potassium to the other side. Sodium chloride needs to go to the right, potassium needs to go to the left. And I'll explain why I think they gave us just times and not millimoles per second. I'll explain as we go through. Okay. Actually, I'm still not sure about that. I'm looking at my data. Anyway, I'm going to explain it how I know it needs to be taught, but there's something wonky about the rates that I'm getting in my data column that is just not making sense to me for what they want us to know. So pay attention to what I tell you that we should be taking away from these experiments, please. Okay. So we had one millimolar ATP and we had our three to two ratio. And we were able to move our sodium from one side to the other and our potassium from one side to the other. That's fine. Everything moved to completion. So that was experiment number one. Experiment number two was asking the question, what will happen if we add more ATP? And that's like saying, what will happen if you have more energy to fuel these pumps? Well, more energy to fuel these pumps means that you had enough energy to go to all of the pumps. Maybe in the first experiment, we only had enough ATP to fuel a few of them. With more ATP, we had more fuel for these 500 pumps. Maybe now with three millimolar ATP, we can visualize that our pumps, one, two, three, four, five, instead of enough ATP just going to two pumps, like we saw with one millimolar, with three millimolar, we were able to get enough ATP to all of the pumps. And if all of the pumps now have energy to work, we were able to move this three to two ratio even more quickly. We were able to move it even more quickly. And then we did experiment number three. With experiment number three, we again had 
300, 3 millimolar ATP, but instead of 500 pumps, we had 800 pumps. We still had our three to two ratio. Just making sure I'm checking my data and my tiny little chart, making sure that I'm following along. Number three. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, experiment three. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Experiment three, we weren't there yet. Let me just redraw experiment number three. Experiment number three. We had only sodium on one side. We did not have potassium on the other. We still had 500 pumps. And we still supplied three millimolar ATP. And in this experiment, we had no movement. No, no amount of sodium chloride was moved at all. And this is the reason why. If the sodium potassium ATPase could talk to you, it would say, in no way am I going to use precious energy, precious cellular energy like ATP to move sodium chloride if I don't have potassium to also move. That carrier, that transporter, I should say, has to be completely loaded with the three to two ratio. So you can think of the sodium potassium ATPase as having binding sites for three sodium and two binding sites for potassium. This, this transporter cannot use ATP unless it's full. Think of it like the bus has to be completely full before it will run. Before we burn gas, we want to make sure we have all of the passengers loaded. Otherwise, it's a waste of fuel. So if we do not have the ATPase fully loaded, then this energy reaction is not going to happen. It would be a waste to the cell. And that is the reason why we had zero movement. Now, in the fourth experiment, this is where we had three millimolar ATP. We had our nine sodium chloride on one side and our six potassium chloride on the other. We had our three to two ratio back. And now we had more carriers. We had more carriers to move and we had still enough energy for all of them. We had a surplus of energy. So this, we wanna compare the, ex, the um, experiment number two with experiment number four, we have enough energy for all of these transporters. All of them are fueled, and now all of them can move this three to two ratio. So what is different? What is different between experiment two 
and experiment four. In experiment two, we had enough energy for all of the carriers. And we were able to move more of these solutes in a certain amount of time. Now we have more carriers and we still have plenty of energy for them all. And what we should have seen in our results is that number four, this experiment, we were able to move more solute in a certain amount of time. Now I'll say it a different way. It took less time for us to move all of these solutes to the other side. All 800 transporters were well fueled. They all were acting like buses to move this three to two ratio. And we were able to move this three to two ratio completely in less amount of time compared to the second experiment. That is what PhysioX wanted us to see. We had more transporters. This tells us that the rate limiting factor was not ATP. If you have enough fuel, you have enough fuel. The rate limiting factor was the number of these pumps, the number of the transporters. If they were all well fueled and you have more of them, we were able to move all nine millimoles of sodium chloride to the right and all six millimoles of potassium to the left in a shorter amount of time. Everything got moved more quickly. In the last experiment, experiment number five, we had our nine to six ratio again. But also with the potassium chloride, we have 10 millimolar glucose. In addition to our eight pumps, 800 I should say, which I'm drawing as eight here, we also had 400 glucose carriers. And the purpose of this fifth experiment was to show, one, that carriers transporters, pumps, whatever you want, whatever you're playing with are specific. They have specificity. The glucose car carriers only moved glucose. The sodium potassium ATPase only moved sodium and potassium. The sodium potassium ATPase did not care that glucose was in the mix. And the glucose carriers did not care that sodium and potassium were in the mix. And when we look at our results, again, we were able to move the sodium chloride to the other side of the beaker and potassium from the right to the left in the same amount of time as experiment four. Separately, we were given a rate for the glucose carriers and our rate had a pound sign after it. That tells us that we didn't have enough carriers 
to move the glucose until equilibrium was reached for glucose before the time ran out. In this last experiment, PhysioX was trying to combine primary active transport concepts with facilitated diffusion concepts. Are there any questions about this activity? Okay, so then the take home message for this activity, carriers, proteins that move solutes, transporters, pumps, any protein that physically interacts with a solute to move it, whether it be down a gradient or against, they are specific. And next, the number of those transporters is the rate limiting factor. If you have more transporters, you can move more. You will have more movement in a certain amount of time. Another way of saying that is many hands make light work. You've heard of that saying. Think about making your holiday dinner and all the dishes that are around and if all of your guests said, hey, we're going to each wash our own dish, think how quick the cleanup would be. So all of your guests would be a transporter and they have a physical interaction with the dish that they are washing. If you have more hands to help with washing the dishes, you wash more dishes in a fewer, fewer minutes, right? then everyone can go sit down and watch the football game if they want to. If it's just you doing the dishes, you're going to spend more time in the kitchen finishing those dishes. So that's the take home message. It's the number of carriers that is the rate limiting factor. Are you okay with that? Okay, then, before Antoinette joins us, I don't think she is with us yet. Nope, she's not. Let me move on to PhysioX number seven. I won't be able to finish the discussion for PhysioX number seven tonight. That's okay, I didn't finish it with the Monday, Wednesday class either. It's a long one. So please turn to PhysioX number three. And PhysioX number three had nine activities. But I only assigned activities three, four, and five, and then seven, eight, and nine. Three, four, and five, seven, eight, and nine. If I had assigned all nine activities, it would have taken you five and a half hours to complete this Physio X. That is absolutely ridiculous. That's a horrendous amount of time. And when I first got this Physio X workbook and I did all nine and it took me five and a half hours, I immediately called the rep and said they need to update it for Physio X number 11 or whatever it is. It's outrageous. <clears throat> Let me tell you what I spared you by not assigning activities one and two. I saved you an hour and a half of time. And in activity, I know, in activity one would have taken you 45 minutes just to learn that the outside of the cell has more sodium and the inside of the cell has more potassium, and the inside of the cell is negative. That's what you would have learned from activity one. If you've been watching your lecture videos, you already know this. Activity two saved you another 45 minutes. In activity two, you would have learned this. 
You cannot see through your nose, smell through your mouth, taste through your ears, or hear through your eyes. That's what you would have learned. You would have learned that receptors are specific for stimuli. Photoreceptors in your retina respond to photons, not sound waves. So that's what I meant by you can't see through your nose, smell through your mouth, taste through your ears, or hear through your eyes. That's what you would have learned. Now let's get to activity three, and that is one that I gave you. In activity three, this is what you were doing. In activity three, you had an axon and you had a stimulating electrode. And you were applying a current into the axon. Downstream, you had a recording electrode. And you were asking, how much current would you have to insert into the axon to get an action potential? Remember, an action potential begins when you open, specifically, sodium voltage-gated channels. They are the first to open. So in this activity, you inserted at first 10 millivolts worth of energy, of a voltage change, sorry. So that meant the cell went from minus 70 to minus 60. And the question was, do you see an action potential in the recording electrode? And the answer was no. Then you applied 20 millivolts of current. And that meant you went from minus 70 to minus 50. And you did get an action potential. After that, you kept going up to 30, 40, and 50. And you kept getting an action potential each time. Okay, and this was an idea of threshold. A lot of textbooks tell you threshold is a number. <clears throat> threshold means you get to minus 55. After minus 55, these sodium voltage gated channels have opened and they open in an all or none fashion. Threshold is not a number. Threshold is a concept. Threshold means that the inside of the cell has become less negative, more positive enough to open sodium voltage gated channels. Sodium voltage gated channels are the ones that open first. Why? They require the least amount of voltage change. They require the least amount of movement from a very negative number to a not so negative number. But yet textbooks keep telling us these magic numbers, resting membrane potential is minus 70 millivolts, they tell us. Depends on which cell you're studying. In unit three, you're going to learn about different types of heart cells and they have different resting membrane potentials. Textbooks keep telling us that this threshold value is a magical minus 55 millivolts, that we go from minus 70 to minus 55. That means you're becoming less negative. 
It's a concept. Threshold means the cell has become less negative inside to a point where sodium voltage gated channels have opened. They are proteins. To open means they've had a conformation change. It's not unlike you. You're sitting there. Heidi's sitting there. I just saw her honey walk by with the baby on his shoulders. And if she wanted to hold her baby, she would have to have a confirmation change. She would have to hold open her arms to receive her baby. That's a confirmation change. Hold open the arms. Sodium voltage gated channels, when they open, also have a confirmation change. The amino acids change position, and this opens a tunnel a lumen that goes through the cell membrane. And once that lumen is open, the ions can flow through it. And when ions are flowing through that tunnel, that lumen, we say there is conductance. From now on, when you are driving down the street and you see a red traffic light, that means you have to stop. I want you to think that your channel is is closed and you cannot conduct yourself through that channel. Think of you yourself as sodium. Your channel is closed. And when that red traffic light turns green and you start to go through the intersection, I want you to say, I am conducting myself through the intersection. And I want you to think of the intersection as your tunnel through the plasma membrane. Threshold is not a number. Each and every voltage gated channel has its own threshold. It's a unique signature for that protein. Threshold means you must make the inside of the cell less negative enough to open that voltage gated channel, to make it have a confirmation change where it is now allowing the ion to flow. This experiment was recreating your Hodgkin and Huxley experiments that I discussed in your lecture for membrane potentials and action potentials. This was the Hodgkin and Huxley experiment. Do any of you have questions? All right, well then I'm going to stop there because we have our sweet tutor Antoinette with us. I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and you, Antoinette, go ahead and unmute yourself and I'm going to give you, um, how do I do this? I'm going to give you co-host so that when you talk, your screen will now grab everybody's screen. So go ahead, Antoinette, welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm gonna keep this really short. I know you guys have been listening to an awesome lecture that was probably a lot of information. Um, so I'm just gonna keep it really uh, short. I'm Antoinette and I'm a tutor for Saddleback College. I'm, um, I'm tutoring um, anatomy and also your, uh, your subject, uh, physiology. I did uh, have Bree, I see her there. I had Bree in my LRC today. Good to see you again, Bree. Um, Bree uh, will tell you that, or if you asked her, she'd tell you we went over um, uh, metabolism. Uh, that's self-study for you guys, right? And that's a, there's a lot of biochem in that, and um, sometimes it could be a little overwhelming. So we covered that, you know, um, the necessary information um, for 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 your exam. We covered that in about an hour, and didn't, didn't we cover a little over an hour today? Um, so I did that review at, um, at the LRC. Um, of course, the, this semester the LRC is going to be um, it's online. So I was just gonna show you guys how to um, access that. Um, you guys can all see my screen, correct? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Here I go. 
I'm going to open up Google Chrome and just, um, you know, make a note because sometimes it's easy to forget some of these instructions. Like, uh, you know, sometimes you're having a difficult time with something because, you know, your computer's not plugged in. I mean, sometimes the, the solution is really that simple. Here, you really need to be using Google Chrome. Um, you should be familiar with that, um, being that you need Google Chrome to, uh, I believe, take all of your tests. So um, I have set up a shortcut um, in, um, on my, uh, my uh, homepage here. And I just click onto Canvas, and that takes me, and I'm sure you're familiar with Canvas. I'm just going to go to my Canvas um, page, right? Um, you you do uh, when you click on a class, you see all of your um, um, your uh, uh, sidebars um, from uh, the teacher has all the different um, uh, uh, subdivisions, like uh, different um, um, areas for unit one, unit two. Over on your sidebar here, you should be able to see um, um, the Saddleback peer uh, peer tutors. When you go into Canvas, when you go into your Canvas, uh, first of all, does everybody know how to sign up for TU300? Yes. Hopefully you all uh, know. I'll, I'll go through that really quickly. It's, it's not that difficult. But anyway, um, you're going to uh, select on biology. And then when I tutor, um, I tutor in uh, an online um, room. Um, there's different um, ways you can set this up up here. I could do um, either a one-on-one -on -one or an online meeting. So I went ahead and I just set up an online meeting. And um, what, when you um, when you uh, sign up for one-on-one, -on -one, you'll come to this page and you'll see oh online meetings. And um, oh Antoinette Morano's physiology session room. That's just what I named it tonight. But you'll see that that um, uh, here I am, and you'll just click in, and that will take you uh, to this page here. And then I'm going to launch video chat. Um, if I just use this platform here, we wouldn't be able to see each other or talk. We would just be texting back and forth. I mean, that would be just awful. So I just go ahead and launch video chat. And when I do that, you have to allow for pop-ups. If you don't allow for pop-ups, you cannot um, use this platform. Please make sure in your settings for Chrome that you allow for pop-ups. And you might just wanna jot that down really quick so you just don't forget. Um, there's sometimes a lot of frustration with um, just something as simple as that, you know, allowing for pop-ups. So I'll just launch um, video chat. I won't do it because we'll get a lot of feedback, but um, I'll launch video chat and then um, we'll be able to see each other kind of like we're seeing each other in this Zoom meeting right now um, if anybody does experience a problem on this uh, with this platform i will immediately start a zoom session which is what you're in right now i will put the zoom link right down in this area where my mouse is just scrolling back and forth so when you enter the meeting all you'll have to do is hit on the zoom link and then that will take you right to uh, the, the meeting the, the the tutoring session does anybody have any questions on that? Everybody's okay? Right, so that's how you use tutoring um, th this year. So just, uh, you know, um, uh, some, some, some tutors uh, have a one-on-one -on -one live room. This platform allows me to tutor um, uh, multiple students at once. So I think um, I've had at one point like 10 people in a, a tutoring session from um, from different classes, from Professor Shaw's class, from uh, Professor Street's class today, and um, for uh, from Marcelo Pierce uh, class as well. So um, uh, just 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 really quickly, I'm just going to go through this so super quick. Um, if you go to library on the Saddleback web, web page and you go to, um, um, let's see, where, where am I to sign up for um, the, oh yeah, library services, sorry, you're going to go down to LRC tutoring, um, you need to register for TU300, right, you're going to register for TU300, uh, we're considered um, the science, sciences, right, so there's your, um, your ticket number is 21120. Then you'll go up to uh, your my site and you just register for the class. You have to be registered in TU300 
to um, access tutoring. It's free. It does not affect your grade in any way. Um, you can sign up for the class, um, um, the, the, the class, and, and never even come. Um, you won't, um, it won't um, uh, affect your grade in any negative way. I, I sometimes hear students say, oh, I'm afraid to sign up for that. And then what if I don't come? And what if I, it, it, nobody knows, right? This service is just here to provide you with free tutoring. And, and that's it for uh, the tutoring. So uh, I hope that was short enough for you. Antoinette, I just want to tell you that I greatly appreciate you taking time from your night to join us, especially at eight o'clock at night and go through this. And I really do hope that the students are listening, that this is a free service. Yeah. Antoinette, my friends, um, she has been with me for years and she once was a student like you in physiology and she took it during summer session and i she won't be offended if i share that she also had a bit of a rough start with some of her early exams and she would be the first to tell you that there is life after these exams that you can adjust and rally and make it through very successfully in this class. So Antoinette is not just a tutor who's been with me for a long time. She also pretty recently, relatively speaking, went through the class and remembers all of the work that it required. And she did it in half the time, a summer session. So that is truly remarkable. She knows the material very well, and she would also be the first one to tell you that there are other tutors, Nathan and Natasha, she mentioned that there were others that can also help. And they have different times, different days that they're available. And the way you would sign up and get to their, their sessions are the same way that Antoinette just went through. I highly recommend taking advantage of these resources. Some of you went through your first exam, studying for it completely on your own with no study groups, no tutors to help you. And that is just the hardest way to get through this class. And most students can't get through the class in that fashion. So please, I am begging you, most students don't feel comfortable coming to my office hours. They feel threatened by me. I don't know why. They feel ashamed that if they show up and they don't have good questions that they're wasting my time. That is not the case. You can show up and just sit there doing your homework with me quietly if you want. I like to think of it as, you know, my kids being small and we would all do our homework together. I would sit next to them. Most of the time they didn't need me, but if they did, I was right there. So if you're ashamed to come to me, embarrassed, you feel awkward, threatened for some reason, then go to one of your tutors. It's called peer tutoring for a reason. They once were like you. Natasha also took my class. Nathan took my class. So please, 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 why not? Why not just for shit kicks? Try it. See if it helps improve your score. If it doesn't, then don't go back. But if it does, hopefully you'll realize this is a really good resource. Now, Antoinette, I'm going to ask, she's circling the other tutors and their times. Antoinette, do you also by chance offer private tutoring? Oh yes, uh, I do uh, offer private tutoring. And you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, I couldn't get Natasha's, uh, I'll stop. Um, let me just stop for just a minute. I wanna get um, Natasha's uh, hours in there uh, Wednesday. So just in case you didn't see those, that's Natasha. She's wonderful. She's, she's incredible. 
I've listened to her explain things and she's just blows me away. And this is Nathan, who's absolutely wonderful, wonderful as well. So you have um, three options here, Nathan, myself, and Natasha. Mm -hmm. and Natasha, I can't say enough good things about Natasha or Nathan. They're absolutely awesome. Um, and here are the hours that um, uh, Natasha, and the, the way you access their tutoring service is the same as mine, right? So I was just uh, giving you a, a, a general uh, way to get into tutoring, but she's there on Wednesday, Thursday, I'm Tuesday, Thursday, and then Nathan is Monday, Wednesday. So you have um, every day except Friday to come in for tutoring. But I'm gonna go ahead and um, write in your, um, uh, write in the chat section, uh, I'm just going to write my uh, email. Does everybody see that? And I'm going to write my phone number. All right. And I don't want to take up your time. If you're, if you're interested in private tutoring, just, just uh, text me. Text me or email me. Um, I'm actually pretty full. I've, I've got, um, I, I was so... Here, I had such a good time today with your anatomy students. I'm just good. I'm in love with them. I, it's just we went over the hard <laughs> day, and we went over your homework pack uh, packet, and I just uh, I haven't had anatomy students in so long, and I just wanted to squeeze their cheeks. They're just so adorable. Um, <laughs> they're so cute. I just you know. So I, I'm actually I'm kind of full. But I do have like maybe a, a little bit of an opening. Um, and, and, and if you wanted to come in, I could maybe partner you up with another group that I have um, from Professor Shaw or Pierce class. That the material is, is, is similar enough that, that you can find. And if it's not, I'll make sure I, um, like Marcelo seems to like to, he likes to ask a lot of questions in digestive, a little bit more so than Dr. Street or uh, Dr. Shaw. So I always like to spend a little more time with his students in digestive uh, system, but um, but it, but it's pretty similar. Um, so I can always uh, slip you in um, if if you are interested. And I just will leave my my number, so I'm not going to take up everybody's time. But yeah, just in love with your anatomy students. Just just so cute today. I'm so <laughs> yes, they are working hard. Um... So thank you very much, Antoinette. You didn't, you, that was perfect. That was absolutely spot on. It is now 8.20 and that's when their, this class ends. So that was perfect timing. Um, friends, do you have any questions for Antoinette or myself before we sign off? Sana, you're still meeting with me, right? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. You just hang on then, okay? Okay. Thank you. No questions? All right. Well, then I will say good night to the rest of you. And thank you. I will see you next week. Have a good week and study hard. Study hard. Study as if the test is next week. Study as if the test is next week. It's not, but pretend it is. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Kara, am I able to ask a question about the Physio X Activity 8, even though we didn't go over it? If it's a quick one, yes, because yeah. I have, I now, I'm, I'm starting, about to start a meeting with Sana, so go ahead, Erica, it's okay. Um, okay, so I just don't understand why um, there were action potentials. There wasn't an action potential at, um, recording electrode two and four. I'm sorry, I think it's two and four, but there was one at like one and three or something. I don't, I don't have like the chart because it doesn't give you there room to do the- different cells you were playing with, Erica. Two different cells. 
And electrodes one and three were in the somas, cell bodies. And that's where you have, um, that's where you have graded potentials, not action potentials. Okay. And in two and four, they were inserted in axons, and those would have action potentials. So it's because the if you saw an action potential because it was after the axon hillock in the axon. That's why. Correct. Okay, that answered my question. That's all I wanted to know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome.